Hi all, I'm Barry Howe and I want to give you my top tips that I've learned from my touring over the last 18 months through Europe. Um, things that I would have liked to have known before I started that helped me through my journey. A lot of you out there have got a lot of experience anyway, uh, so please add comments in the comment sections down below or on Instagram or Facebook. And if we get enough comments there, I will make another video so the motorbiking community can benefit from this consensual wisdom. So number one, just do it. That's the number one tip really. People can plan, 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 and before you know it, they've delayed, 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 and in the worst case scenario, they've never even started or don't go at all. So I think you just go with the kit you've got, just get out on the bike and tour. You'll soon realize as you go what you do need and what you have packed additional, and then you'll just compensate for it as you go. But the most important thing is just go, just do it, do the ride. Start the job and you know, make changes, tweak it as you go along. So that's my number one tip. Number two, GPS, whether it's a standalone GPS or whether it's a, a phone with Waze or Google Maps on it, um, turn off the highways and the toll roads uh, settings. The last thing you want to be doing is doing this motorbike trip and going on highways. That's the last thing you want to do. That's not really what the touring is about. Touring is about going slow, enjoying the sights, enjoying the views. And if you're going too fast on the highway, A, you can't see it it's gone too quickly and B that's not where the sites generally are so you get on the back roads and the back roads are going to have all the nice views all the nice sites you're going to go at a nice pace and you will get to see everything so just turn off the highway and toll road settings and that means you'll be in the right place to see the right things and going at the right pace and that's where there's no traffic and the nice views to see that's number two Okay, tip number three, panniers. You're going to need somewhere to store your luggage, whether it's hard or soft, and that's the question. Which way do you go, hard or soft? Depends on your individual requirements, so you need to think about this, about what you're actually going to do, what sort of riding you're going to do, how much space you actually need, what kit you're going to take. So for me, it was very, very clear cut. It was a hard case. Reason for that is I got three cases, so two side cases, one rear case, and you can see the images in the picture here. Um, and for me, it's all about security because I'm gonna leave my bike at various destinations because I'm doing my trip in stages. So it makes sense to have the security of the hard case. So in addition to the security, they clip off very, very quickly. So when I arrive at a hotel, yes, a hotel, not camping, sorry about that, hardcore campers, um, I would just clip off one of them and one of them has all my kit in for my clothes and toiletries etc the other two are for kit for the bike and other things so i clip off one take it into the hotel and open it up and i've got it there very very quick very very simple and if i want to explore the city i've just arrived in i just clip off all three cases take them into the hotel take them into the room then get on the bike the bike's nice and light uh, very very agile so i can go and explore the city so for me that makes sense the hard panniers the soft ones, well, you know, the big debate on the soft and why a lot of people go for soft is if they're doing more hardcore off-roading, if the bike is dropped, which eventually happens, um, if you've got hard cases, it will damage, potentially damage your bike and damage the cases as well. So the soft panniers are a little bit more giving and a little bit more uh, suitable for off-road. So how much off-roading you're going to do, I don't know. You have to decide that. Number four, rain gear. Now. This is particularly close to my heart because when I started my trip in London, uh, my first destination was Brussels and I had to do that in one day. So essentially my trip started in London and it rained from London all the way to Brussels. So what I was wearing was allegedly waterproof except for certain items of kit which was not really appropriate for the trip, I'll, I'll say that. Um, anyway, I got soaked, my kit got soaked Manufacturers would say it's waterproof, it's rainproof, but trust me, four hours in the rain, these items kit will not be waterproof. So for me, the only way to guarantee you're going to stay dry is to get plastic rain overgear. Um, this is for sure going to keep you dry. Um, it's very cheap and it folds up very, very small, so you can pack it away nice and neatly in your kit. So that's my recommendation, get plastic rain overgear 
and make sure you get over booties and over gloves or a second pair of gloves because no doubt you'll probably need them. Number five, disc lock. Uh, security is critically important. Uh, if you lose your ride, you're going to lose your trip, you're going to lose your adventure, you're going to lose uh, a lot of time, you're going to be flying back home, it's going to be costs, etc. It's not where you want to be. So get something to protect your bike. I would opt not to go for a chain and a padlock. Um, I started off with a chain, found out it was big, cumbersome, heavy, and really frustrating using it. And, and to be quite honest, from a safety and security standpoint, it is as weak as its weakest link, which is generally the padlock. Padlocks are very easy to grind, very easy to cut into or clip. So again, a chain may look, may look very robust, may look very strong, but from a security standpoint, a disc lock, I think, gives you better protection. They're much harder to grind off, very difficult to um, access. I use an Abus Granite Detecto X8008, which has an inbuilt alarm. Um, it's about $200. I'll put the link on the comment section down below if you want to get it. You can get it off Amazon. Um, it's a very good lock. It comes with an alarm on it, which is a doubly uh, useful mechanism because A, it's a security standpoint. B, these locks are notorious for getting it, that you've got them on the bike and you go to ride off and you can do damage to your bike. So the alarm will actually go off as you move the bike. Stop. You'll stop before you do any damage to the bike. So disc lock is a great way to protect your bike. Very small, very neat. You can put it in your luggage away. It doesn't weigh as much as a padlock and chain. So for me, a disc lock is a way to go. Number six. The bike. The bike itself. Are you going to buy the bike for the most extreme situation you're going to encounter on your tour? Or are you going to be sensible, That's I, I, I think it's sensible, to buy the bike that's most suited for the majority of your journey? So by that I mean if you are only going to do sort of 5% off-roading, do you just go megabucks into an off-roading bike that is designed specifically for off-roading um, and that's pretty much where you're at. You're gonna spend a lot of money on this machine that you're only gonna do 5% of your journey. Now, for me, I do 95% actually on tarmac. So it makes sense to have a bike that is gonna cope better or is, is more suitable for tarmac but can go off-road. So you've got to think about that and go with your personal circumstances and what I've learned is I'm doing my tour on a Honda Cross Tour 1250, it's very big, it's very heavy um, and if I had my time again to do this tour I would definitely go for a 750, 800, smaller machine that's lighter, um, more agile, um, you think that you need that power but you really really don't, especially if you're following the method of switching off tow roads and highways because you're going to be going down the back roads and the back roads, the, the, the small roads are where all the sites are. You don't actually go that fast so you don't need all that power. I would say you're probably going between 80 and 120 kilometers max. So you don't need a big 1200, 1250cc motorbike to cope with that. Number seven, a bike cover. Particularly important for me because I'm leaving my bike for extended periods at airports or locations where I want it to be out of sight, out of mind. So for example, when I go to an airport, I usually park in a short-term car park and I look for somewhere under shelter and close to a CCTV. I lock the bike, I put the cover on, it's out of sight, out of mind. I think it takes away the attraction of theft, it has the added benefit of obscuring your number plate. So if the airport has a rule or a maximum stay, some of them say three weeks, four weeks, whatever it may be, if you're a little bit late, well, at least they're not looking at your number plate. They're not really going to go over and lift up the, 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 the cover and really look at it in detail. I've never had a problem. Um, so a bike cover is something that folds up very small, very compact, but yet affords you a lot of uh, benefits in the terms of security. So for me, a bike cover is a really important attribute to your kit. Recently I was hanging out with a very new vagabond. He's, he was on the road for about a week and he didn't have anything for gear and really had no idea how to camp. He'd never done anything like this before. And I remembered even from when I started that I was reluctant to spend the money on the gear. So 
cheap gear versus expensive gear, <laughs> you're gonna buy the cheap gear, you're gonna have a bad time, and then you're gonna buy the expensive gear. At, at this point in my Vagabond career of three and a half years, I have over a thousand dollars invested into my hammock, tarp, and sleeping bag system, which is a, actually a quilt. So my most important things is to stay warm, dry, and happy. And so, again, you're probably not going to buy the expensive gear from the get-go, but when you suffer enough, it'll change your mind. Number nine, power banks. Now, you're riding your bike for hours and hours upon hours. Um, you're running down your GPS, you're running down your electronic devices. Um, this is something you need to think about. So you have to have the emergency power banks to supply these devices. Um, you're generally rural location, so it's not easy to access um, mains facilities and cafes, etc. You could be or largely riding down sort of these very um, isolated countryside lanes, etc. So you want to make sure you have plenty of backup power using power banks to power all your devices. Number 10, mains power. This is really important and I think for me, this amazing difference when I had this put on my bike. My, most bikes now come, or most modern new bikes, come with mains power via a cigarette lighter type adapter. So you plug in the adapter and you can put USBs in and you can charge your devices. My bike didn't, so I had to do that separately. And it's cheap and very easy to do it. You basically buy what they call a battery tender. You can get it on Amazon. I'll put the link in again. Um, they're about $10, $15, so they hook up to your battery um, and then they, you feed the wire to the location you want it and then you have a what, whatever type of connection you want. Again, so I did this in a cigarette lighter with a USB, so it had uh, a connection. I put a USB cigarette lighter in, two connections into that. You can even get four or five, I think, but then you can run off that with multi-cables and put it into your tank bag and you can pretty much charge everything to your heart's content for all your devices, recharge your battery power backs. You can make sure you have everything ready to go, continuously fed, en route whilst you're driving. So for me, that was a revelation and a real gift, and it was very cheap to do as well. So 100% definitely, definitely do that. Make sure you have continuous power on your bike whilst you're riding.